Welcome to Bookshavia TV. I'm John Purcell. I'm delighted to be here with Tony Park, author of The Hunter. Welcome, Tony. Thanks, John. Thanks for having me over. Now, you've written much more than just The Hunter. You've got a, a, a swag of books under your belt now. Um, and Africa is your muse, I would say. Um, tell us a little bit about The Hunter. I want to get straight into, into the book. Um, and then I'll maybe talk to you about Africa because I'm really interested in finding out what it's like living there at the moment. Sure, yeah, well, The Hunter is uh, my 11th novel. Um, all the previous ones have been set around Southern Africa, and as, as is most of the action in The Hunter. Um, as with the previous books, what I did was, was write this one on location. And as has also happened in the past, the, the idea came for it out of the blue. It was actually a conversation I was having with a, a friend of mine in Zimbabwe who's a private investigator, a private detective, actually works for a security company. And he had kind of stumbled upon this niche market for himself, which is investigating insurance claims. Um, and what happens is people uh, who have been living in Zimbabwe, many people have had to leave the country because of its economic woes and its troubles. And particularly what's happened with people moving to the UK, as it turns out, is uh, some people go across to the UK, get a job, take out an insurance policy, a life insurance policy. They go home to Zimbabwe for a holiday and mysteriously die. So they're faking their own yeah. deaths as an insurance claim. So that's the premise for The Hunter. It's about uh, a young woman uh, who uh, uh, has been working in the UK. She, um, she returns to Zimbabwe and may or may not have faked her own death. Certainly her friend, who is the, the claimant on the insurance policy, uh, it becomes the, the subject of an investigation. We have a private investigator, a new character of mine, a guy by the name of Hudson Brand, who is a safari guide come private investigator, is sent to track down this woman, Lindley Brown, who is the beneficiary of the, uh, of the dead woman's uh, insurance policy. And that investigation takes him through South Africa, Zimbabwe, and in what's a bit of a departure for me up into Kenya, where the, the book has its conclusion. So I've widened my kind of scope in Africa a little bit with this book. With your, with your background, you, you, you're, a, you're Australian, you were in the Australian Army. Um, what was it that got you to Africa and what, what, what was it that kept you there and your imagination there? It was my wife that got me to Africa, <laughs> basically. I, uh, to tell you the truth, John, I, I never had any great burning desire to go to Africa. Uh, uh, my wife, Nicola, uh, was always the one who would plan our, our holidays. We started travelling when we, were, when we were first together and when we got married. We did a lot of overseas travel when we were younger. Like a lot of Aussies, we backpacked around Europe and Asia. And um, eventually she said, well, let's go to Africa. And I said, well, okay, sure. No problem at all. And that was my level of interest and involvement in that holiday, which was in 1995. So we went on a, a three-week holiday back then to Southern Africa, to South Africa, Zimbabwe uh, and Botswana. And something happened within the first or second day, I was bitten by something or drank something or breathed something in. But uh, we both realised very early on in that trip that this was not going to be a once in a lifetime trip. This was going to be anything but, because the more we saw of this amazing continent, these very interesting countries, uh, the more we realised that we would only be scratching the surface and we'd have to come back. So that's, that's, why, that's when we got hooked on Africa, simply by fluke, I guess, um, back in 95. And, and it was around about that time or in the year or two after that that I got serious about wanting to write a novel. And after a false start, um, I was back in Africa and I thought, why don't I just set a book in Africa? And that was my first novel, uh, Far Horizon, which was set on a fictitious tour around Southern Africa and it followed the path of our travels at that time and I wrote that purely out of fun and because I was enjoying travelling in Africa and never expected to get published but it did, that was my first novel. And now you go back all the time, what are you doing when you go back? Yeah we did spend uh, about six months of the year in Africa and six months in Australia and I have done since Far Horizon, since the first book came out and that's just kind of become our life uh, and our lifestyle. Again it wasn't something that we intended, I never set out to be living half my life in in Africa, but what I did find, uh, what worked for me as an Australian writing about a different continent and other people's countries, is that the only way I could uh, hopefully do it justice or, or write a book that that might be credible was was to write it on location while I was there. Yeah. And it takes me about six months to write the first draft of a novel. So what I found works for me is uh, if I follow the same formula that I, I did when I was writing that first book. If I'm writing every day while we're travelling around different countries, different places, and, and kind of almost chronicling that as part of my novel, 
uh, it's a it's a great excuse to travel. It's a lot of fun, and it's uh, for me it's a good way to, to write a book. And that's that's how I've attacked all the books since then. And you've been able to do that. Um, like, are you working while you're there as well? Is there is like you're working writing, but are you working a job? Like, there's a lot of writers out there who are going. Tony Park and write and have this life. This is fantastic. <laughs> all writers amazing. live an awesome life. Yeah, look, I mean, I think one of the first things I was told when I was first published by Pam McMillan by my publisher. I was told three things. One, I should be grateful that they've published me, which I was. Uh, two, uh, don't expect to be going and going out and talking about your books because no one will listen, so thanks for having me. And, and three, don't expect to make any money out of it because uh, they want people to be grounded and know that it's not an instant ticket to, to riches for most novelists. I think only about 10% of Australian novelists, novelists make enough money out of their books to live on them. Uh, so what I was doing for the first several years that um, I was still writing books, I was writing books in Africa, was coming back to Australia for six months of the year and working my bum off, basically yeah. working very hard doing contract uh, uh, public relations work, freelance writing, and my wife Nicola works, still does work as, a, as an IT consultant. Um, what I've found over the last few years, John, I've, I consider myself very lucky. Um, I've written six non-fiction books as well too, um, biographies. And around about the time that they started being published, when I was doing two books a year now instead of one, I found that I could pretty well pay my share of the bills just from the, just from the writing. So I write full time now, so I'm not doing a day job at all. I think my day job is um, is writing biographies. So if if writing the novels is is writing the novels to me is like a, a cross between living my dream and being in semi retirement and paid to do my hobbies. It's, it's my love and my passion. And yet what I've been lucky enough to do is is to pick up some contracts to write non fiction, which I would probably sum up as the best day job in the world. <laughs> so yeah. I really enjoy being able to write full time. Keeps me busy. Keeps me busy through the year. Well, you've 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 plugged into a. Uh, a country and a subject that is so rich, like <laughs> the things that are going on in Africa, you know, some people don't even believe, and you put exactly. it into fiction, you go, no one's going to believe that. Exactly. Um, how do you cope with the, with, with the, I suppose, when you come back here, because you're going to get, when you, now in the next few days, you'll be hearing all about Ebola here, and the, the representations of Africa um, from here, uh, which are incorrect, I mean, like, we have a mutual friend, um, Peter Allison, mm -hmm. uh, yeah. and I, I, follow, I follow him on Facebook. He's constantly putting up maps showing you where Ebola is and where the safari parks are exactly. to try and continue to, yeah. to have uh, the money that comes into the safari parks, which support things like the, um, the rangers looking after the rhinos and all this sort of stuff that, that trickles on. And our, our fears and our ignorance are far away on the other side of the world. Um, how, how do you balance all of that? How do, you, how do you pick and choose what part of Africa you're going to talk about? What countries, what dilemmas, what, there's just so much. Yeah, exactly, there is so much, and I think you hit the nail on the head by saying that some of the things that happen in real life in Africa, if you put them in a novel, people wouldn't believe it. And I, I have that problem all yeah. the time, where I'm writing something that I think, I'm starting to think, well, I'm probably pushing the boundaries, being a little bit outrageous here, uh, and then it turns out to be true. I, I had a scene in one of my previous books, Ivory, which is about modern day piracy, where the pirates hijack this a container ship full of luxury 4x4s and drive them off. And as I was writing it, I thought, this is ridiculous. But then I turned on the radio over in South Africa on the BBC World Service, and there was a story about how some modern day pirates had just hijacked a ship full of battle tanks for the Kenyan army. So I wish I'd thought of that. But yeah, <laughs> truth is definitely stranger than fiction. Uh, however, truth gets distorted as well, too. Uh, I think one of the problems with the continent of Africa is that the, the rest of the world um, can never see the continent's problems as anything other than unsolvable and dire and scary and something to get absolutely upset about. And, and the, the reality is, is that the countries in Africa are no different to Australia. They experience the same problems that we do. They have crime, corruption, they have health issues, uh, political mismanagement, all these things happen in Australia. Mm -hmm. But the degree is often greater in, yeah. in Africa. The causes can often be the same. Um, so I think the, the problem with something like the current scare over Ebola is people are going into overdrive about it. And as Peter Allison has pointed out, I mean, we're, countries in Western Europe are closer to West Africa where the Ebola virus is than any tourist destination in Southern Africa is. Like, I've just come back from South Africa and look, there's a mention of Ebola occasionally mm -hmm. in the press, but really, it's not a problem. So it doesn't really get a mention. You know, there are people in America and Australia and the UK going into absolute hysterics. About is, is that partly um, a kind of a, a racist reaction to it? It, it, it? I think we're just conditioned to always expecting the worst. We, we kind of have this 
um, uh, it's a simplistic uh, judgmental view of the continent that oh, here it goes again it's all going to implode and it's terrible now the unfortunate thing is is that the really serious issues in Africa don't get the attention from the outside world that they should. More people are killed in Africa every year by the mosquito than anything else. Mm -hmm. uh, people continue to die from malaria. Uh, and there have been some, some good people around the world. I think Bill Gates' foundation was involved in it, looking at uh, research into malarial vaccinations and things. That's where we should be concentrating. Sure, Ebola's a problem that has to be dealt with, but I mean, let's get our priorities right. Mm. And, and while um, there's often intermittent, well, there's always intermittent coverage about political troubles uh, in the continent. Uh, a country that's very close to my heart, Zimbabwe, uh, is, is more often than not out of the news. Uh, whereas really, if the international community wanted to do some real good, um, they, would, they would step up the pressure for change in, in that area. Uh, and another country that I haven't visited but I would, I'd like to very much is the Democratic Republic of Congo, which has basically been in a state of war mm. for about the last 30 or 40 years, and yet it's all too hard. So we don't pay any attention to that. Sure, we focus a lot of effort in the Middle East and whatever, but, but the continent almost seems too hard in some respects. So we either overreact, we being the Western world, or we ignore it. And, and neither of those reactions are good. In your, in your, your books are, uh, are thrillers, and, and in, in this one there's a, there's a sort of a detective side of things. Um, Am I right to say that anyone who has grown up enjoying the Wilbur Smith novels will jump in and enjoy your books? Uh, I have been a fan of Wilbur Smith over the years, but I was particularly drawn to his earlier work mm. from the 70s, 80s and 90s, where he went through a phase where, where I think he wrote his best, his best work, um, where he was writing about contemporary Southern Africa a lot of the time, the, the same sort of areas that I'm writing about now, and the same sort of issues. But back then, mm -hmm. he, he wrote some uh, excellent books set in South Africa and Zimbabwe at the time that, that, that brought the, the continent's uh, beauty and its troubles and its politics, yeah. uh, which were very contentious, uh, to a wider audience via, via fiction. And I think if there is any similarities uh, between... Um, the great Wilbur Smith and myself, it might be that I'm, I, I write thrillers set against the backdrop of contemporary Africa. And that would be probably where the similarity starts and ends. So, look, I get a lot of my readers uh, have said they're fans of, of Wilbur Smith, which makes me feel great, <laughs> terrific, if they want to read my books as well. Uh, so I think, yeah, if, if you looked at, at that, uh, that sort of part of his career, uh, which he's moved away from now, but that's, that's probably where the similarities lie. And you're being sold in, in Africa. Yeah. yeah. Mm. So we're, we're, the litmus test is, can you sell back? You know, th that's their country. And yeah, you're, exactly. Yeah. You're an outsider writing about the country and they're gobbling it up. Yeah, look, I'm very lucky. Uh, I'm, I'm very pleased that the, the books have done well in, in South Africa and it's a great market for me and it's where I choose to live most yeah. of my time. So for the six months that my wife and I stay in Southern Africa, the majority of that time is in South Africa. We recently bought a house there. We love it. It's a great country. And uh, when I get an email uh, from a South African reader and they said they've enjoyed the, the book or an email from someone in Zimbabwe who's enjoyed the book, it makes me feel absolutely chuffed. Most of those emails start out the same way. They, they generally start out saying, when I heard there was an Australian writing book set in Africa, I thought they were going to be rubbish. <laughs> But, <laughs> and it's like, there's always a, a few tense seconds when I'm reading those emails waiting for the butt to come in there. Thank you very much for taking the time to talk to us. Tony. Thanks, Charles. My pleasure. Thanks for having me. All of Tony's books are available from booktopia.com.au right now.